to the Personal Injury Law Show. This show talks about everything current in the law of personal injuries and of importance to the year to viewer. My name's Tony Carbone. I'm a personal injury lawyer of 30 years experience. With me too, I've got John Carancis, a partner at a law firm in your workers' compensation. Good evening, John. Hi, Tony. Hi, viewers. And Alice Robinson, an associate in a law firm in insurance law. Good evening, Alice. Good evening, Tony. Good evening, viewers. Tonight, viewers, have got a very interesting show. We've got Ian Prendergast, the General Manager for Player Relations of the AFL Players Association. Join us, so stay tuned for that. However, Tony, before we get to that, what's in the news? John, Alice, there's been a lot of stories in the news. There's been some very interesting ones, but the one that really worries me is that companies, there's this article about companies must pay for workplace deaths. What's this all about, John? It's a shocking state of affairs, Tony. 20 workers have died in Victoria in the last 12 months. It seems like a big number, doesn't it, Alice? It does seem like a lot, Tony. And, Tony, 48 workers have died in Australia-wide in the last 12 months. Well, I think any loss of life is, you know, one person being lost, you know, at work is one too many. One too many. Mm. And, Alice, they're talking about introducing uh, heavier penalties in terms of jail time for directors and that. Do you agree with that? Oh, yes, I think so, Tony. It's always a difficult issue when you're talking about how to punish a company or a corporation for something like a death. And that is, that is difficult because of the size of the corporation and quite often it's all about the fines that get imposed. But there is talk of putting directors personally in jail, which is obviously a really big punishment. And that's something I think we'll see a bit more of in the future. Well, John, I don't think monetary punishment's enough, do you? No, no. You've yeah. got corporations that are worth billions of dollars. Yeah. And a $50,000, $100,000 fine. Even $300,000. It's not enough. Yeah, yeah. It's you like need to cash. make the directors personally liable. And so they take everything seriously. Exactly. Not that they're not, but they're, at the end of the day, too many deaths. Exactly. Well, look, we'll come back to this story. Um, what about these apartments at La Crosse in La Trobe Street, Alice? Uh, there was a fire that just seemed to combust so quick, um, and that is allegations that the materials used were not compliant. Yes, Tony, that recently a report's come out from the Melbourne Fire Brigade in relation to this building and it's obviously a really sad situation. A lot of people have been displaced from their homes as a result of this fire and as I understand it are still displaced as mm. a result and the Fire Brigade's found that the materials used to build the building are possibly not compliant and actually encourage the fire as opposed to stopping it or slowing it down. So it's a bit of a concern. John, what worries me, I don't want to mention names because at this stage there are only allegations and there might be court proceedings fine from this. Oh, yeah. But uh, very big builder involved yes. and also very well-known architects, etc. And you'd imagine if this particular building is not compliant, how many buildings are not compliant? Exactly. Oh, yes. It's, uh, Tony, it's a good case. It's yeah, a good claim. It's, it's, it's a worrying trend because um, I understand the legislation changed a few years ago in terms of what um, can be used on these buildings. So it's going to be interesting as this unfolds. So we'll keep you po uh, posted on this, viewers. Um, Outside Burger King, John, this fellow goes to get something to eat and he gets bolted by four angry men. It's an interesting claim, Tony. This happened uh, a, a few years ago now. It's, it's in the middle of the night. He's uh, attended this Burger King store and uh, the policy there, it seems that the doors are locked, they're closed. So does that mean you order your food, what, through... An intercom. Uh, an intercom. An intercom. I'm and, not sure. And he's been whacked from behind, a king hit. He suffered serious injuries. Now, the claim is that Burger King have uh, breached their duty of care to him, Tony. Yeah, well, they've got security at this place, which is interesting. I mean, why would you have security if you don't think that it's well, unsafe? Tony, Tony, the security yeah. guard was inside the door, <laughs> inside the uh, uh, the store with the door locked. It is so, a bit of a worry, isn't it? So it was great for the people inside the store, but what about the people outside the store? Well, the issue is going to be whether there was a breach of duty here, because That's at right. the end of the day, 
You've got an obligation to ensure that people come onto your premises are safe. I say, that's yes. right. And this mm. is a strange case, Tony. We're talking about a 24-hour fast food operation. And unfortunately, this fellow suffered from a coward punch as a result of being locked out for reasons that aren't really clear on the article. But what does seem really interesting is that for a 24-hour fast food place, they're not letting people into the restaurant mm. to wait for their food or order their food or however it is that it works. And this happened in the early hours of the morning. Exactly. So you can imagine there's been a bit of intoxication involved exactly. by... All the parties. I think our foreseeability will be an issue, won't it, Tony? Yeah, look, I, I actually think it's a good case because mm. um, they would have done a risk assessment mm. and to have a security guard, on the, albeit on the inside, someone must have said there could be issues there. That's right, they yeah. haven't got security for no reason. <laughs> so I think you'd be asking for their risk assessment report, yes. which would be pretty important on discovery. Uh, we'll let you know what happens to your viewers. Keep, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, what about this, John? This, uh, <laughs> not, I wouldn't say, uh, most attractive looking bloke. No. He's got a goatee <laughs> and beard and whatever else, and uh, BHB sacked him. He's and given the sack for having a beard, Tony. Yeah. Against yeah. company regulations. Well, there was a policy issued, Alice saying that you've got to be clean shaven for health reasons or safety reasons. That's right. Look, Tony, this is a fair work matter in relation to this fellow's dismissal, which is very unfortunate. He was working as an underground truck driver for BHP and he was dismissed because he refused to comply with the company policy to be clean shaven. And this is a matter where um, companies have got to go, big companies like BHP have got to be able to operate in a sensible manner. And when employees don't comply with policy and you might think, well, it seems a bit harsh to be sacking somebody for not being clean shaven, it but is. you get one policy being mm. ignored and then you can get the more important policies perhaps come into question later on and that's a real problem for big yes. companies. Very, very nasty beard here. <laughs> but I can't understand. If he's working as a truck driver, I don't know where the health and safety issues kick in. Exactly. Um, yeah. I think it's, is it just a blanket policy? I think it's no. more of a blanket policy and it, it does seem a little odd in the circumstances, but I think it's a matter of overall compliance as opposed so to it's the a, particular It's policy. another example that employees, unfortunately, have to abide by the, the policies rules. of the company. Yep, the even rules. though they seem unfair, Tony. So, viewers, the moral of the story is, if your company's got a policy, unless, you're unless your employer's prepared to waive that policy, follow the rules, because you won't win at the uh, Fair Work Commission. No. That's a sad case, Yes. Now, this is very interesting and pertinent to today's discussion. The US court orders the National Football League to pay concussion, player, uh, concussion compensation to players. Now, they're going to be awarding over 20 years about a billion dollars to about 5,000 former players. Alice, I think a billion dollars is going to be seriously watered down over 20 years with inflation. Yes, I think this might be an issue, Tony, and this, this is also very interesting to me because the article talks about the billion dollars also providing in some form for the future compensation of mm. players. And the NFL's really struggled with this issue over a very long period of time, and so it is a really landmark decision in relation to having that compensation available for concussion or people suffering from neurological disorders as a result of concussion. And I think at the end of the day, I, the question may well be, is the billion dollars enough? or is it going to end up being a financial mm. black hole in some senses? But it's, they really have struggled with this issue for a long time, so it's an incredible it's, decision. It's important to note that the NFL have not conceded that concussion causes injury, oh, issues. neurological injury not to the Notwithstanding the decision, that's right. But, well, they've they basically made an out-of-court settlement that here's a billion dollars for the next 20 years and let's see what we can do. Well, it's a lot cheaper than what it would have cost if they actually went to court and won for 5,000 people. Well, exactly, yeah. exactly. Viewers, we've got to go to a sponsor's break. After a break, we're going to be speaking to Ian Prendergast, and we'll be talking about this issue of players' rights and safety issues. So stay tuned. <laughs>
girls, welcome back to the show. As I said before the break, we'll be talking about uh, professional athletes and work cover, in particular uh, footballers. Now, tonight we're very fortunate to have Ian Prendergast, the general manager of the AFL Players Association. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, Tony. John, thanks for having me. And viewers, so that you know, Ian's background's a former footballer for the uh, Carlton Footy Club, and he also studied a Bachelor of Laws from Monash University, and you graduated in 1996. Uh, 1999, uh, 19, uh, 2006. Oh, okay, I graduated, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, played from 99 until 2006 at Carlton, so finishing my degree the year I got the flick worked out well from a timing point of view. So, <laughs> Ian, you finished playing footy and you took up this role with the AFL Players Association, is that correct? Yeah, I worked for three years as a lawyer in commercial okay. litigation, two years in Adelaide and then a year back in Melbourne before taking the role with the PA and I've been with the association for just over five years now. And John, the role of uh, Ian and his team is to look after AFL footballers and their rights, obligations, mm. etc. Um, it's an important role, isn't it? Oh, Tony, uh, time and time again we, we hear the issues regarding, you know, players uh, suffering serious injuries, suffering health problems as a result of being a footballer. Yeah, yeah. And Ian, your job is to uh, make sure something comes about from that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's an important role. I mean, players um, were excluded from workers' compensation legislation back in 1978. And the government at the time actually said they'd commit to um, exploring another scheme to cover professional athletes, including AFL players. But nothing's, nothing's happened on that front since. So the role we play in collectively bargaining um, injury compensation obviously becomes critical. Uh, whilst players are in the game, the injury compensation they receive is, is quite comprehensive. But if they have an injury that causes them to finish playing, that coverage after they leave the game is, is quite limited, notwithstanding that we know at least 64% of players have ongoing issues in relation to injuries that um, they incurred whilst playing that affect their day-to-day -day life after they finish the game. Ian, under the Accident Compensation Act in Victoria, the only sporting association, if you can call it that, are jockeys, they're picked up by the legislation. Mm. Now, has that got to do with the fact that the majority of jockeys aren't on really big money? So the Accident Compact probably uh, caters for them, John. Whereas when you're dealing with footballers, the lowest paid footballer, what be, well, would they be on? Oh, the, the rookies are getting about 60 grand a year, yeah. so it's not yeah. a huge amount, but no. it's a substantial amount for young guys coming into the competition. But if you've been in the game for a couple of years and you're showing a bit of potential? Yeah, the average salary is about 270 grand okay. at the moment. Okay. So the accident compact, John, based on those figures, mm. would not really look after the footballer? No, no, it's not on those figures, no. No, no. Now, is your job at the association to try and help them get onto the Accident Compensation Act or are you looking for something totally different? Yeah, I think um, AFL players are fortunate that they have a, you know, a well-organised um, group of players, you know, obviously um, assisted by a strong developed players association. There's plenty of professional athletes who don't have the same representation. I think one of the reasons why um, the jockeys weren't excluded in 1978 was because they actually had strong representation at the time. Um, the Players Association in the AFL has only really evolved um, in recent times, mm. uh, relatively speaking. I, th I so think it helps when you've got close connections mm. with the government of the day. Absolutely. Ian, you know, I was looking at the stats mm. and I found that across the board jockeys are earning a lot, lot less than footballers. Yeah, well, that might be right. I mean, the leading jockeys are, are doing very well out of the yes. sport. But, um, you know, jockeys also are at a, a very high risk of, of injuries, in, including fatalities, mm. unfortunately, in that sport. So it's interesting. They're covered by workers' compensation, mm. but other, um, you know, relatively speaking, lower-risk sports. So, Ian, currently, every footballer is covered by the AFL for medical expenses? Yeah, whilst they're in the game, it's covered under the collective bargaining agreement. Yes. Um, and if you're injured whilst playing at senior level, you receive match payments for the period of time that you're out. If you're on a, a basin match contract, if you're injured in the second tier competition, then you're also covered for longer term injuries um, to a limited extent. But um, we, have, we have guaranteed contracts in the mm. AFL. So that basically means if you're injured whilst you're contracted, you're looked after. Mm. After you leave the game, you're covered for 12 months for any injuries um, detailed on your exit medical. But then after that, basically pay us, players have own. to pick up the bill 
for the ongoing rehabilitation or treatment that their injuries require, unless they're suffering from hardship. And current players have actually put 250 grand a year towards looking after past players who fall on hard times to help get them back on track. But that's current players funding that at the moment. Just to get it right, Ian, assuming you've got a, uh, a footballer on a three-year contract, mm. they're, they're injured in their first year, yep. based on what you said, they'll get their uh, payments every week? Yeah, that's right. They'll be, they'll get, if they can't play again, they'll get paid out for the next couple of years. Okay. We also have a final year injury payment, which is for career-ending injuries that occur in the final year of a player's contract. But the test is whether that means they can't play football at any level again. So okay. it's a pretty high bar that they need to meet. And um, we've had some success in getting a number of those payments up in, in recent years, but it is limited. So for 30 year plus, uh, if you're 30 years or older, it's 50% of your base contract in your final year. And then it's a higher percentage if you're a younger player to reflect the impact it has on your, on your career. But effectively, it only covers one year, doesn't it? Well, effectively, yeah, it does. So it's not really much looking forward, is it, Joe? No, especially if, for example, Tony, you need a hip replacement in 10 years' oh, time. Yeah, for sure. That's an issue then, isn't it? It is. It's a massive issue. Um, Ian and John, Charter of Athletes' Rights, are you pushing for this? Yeah, so um, the, our Players Association sits with a number of other Players Associations um, on the Australian Athletes Alliance uh, group. It represents 3,500 3, professional team sports um, athletes. And um, there's a Charter of Athletes' Rights that we've put together with the other sports, which I think outlines the, the fundamental rights that we say athletes have and, and should be protected by sports. John, this charter, you, you want to go through a couple of these things with me? The first one is, has a right to access and pursue sport as a career based solely on merit. I'm not even sure what that, that means. Basically it means you get selected based on form. Okay. Um, okay. So you don't discriminate mindset. between players effectively? Yeah, that's right. Tony, I like number five. Must be provided, a player must be provided with a safe workplace which protects the athlete's physical and mental health and his or her social well-being. An athlete must be treated and supported when injured. Yeah, it's a pretty broad-based sort of uh, provision there, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it is. And there's obviously a lot that that encaptures. And safe workplace, John. I guess, you know, there's been issues with Eddie Head, for example, at the moment. The, um, the, the outside the plane surface, yep. Ian, have you yeah. taken that up at all? Oh, we had, a, we had a close look at that, so an independent expert um, provided us with a report. We worked through a process with the AFL, basically asked for them to assure us that there was no risk whatsoever, oh. um, which they provided us, but that'll be, that'll be ongoing that matter. We've got a Brisbane player that can't play at the moment. Yeah, he's done table knee reconstruction, John. Mm. Yeah, and the query is whether the artificial turf has contributed to his injury. Yeah. Well, just so the other night I was at the footy watching Hawthorne, uh, North Melbourne, and I noticed the players, once they got over the line, they slipped a lot more. Yeah, the, the AFL tells us that it performs um, the same as the, the natural turf, but clearly, given it's an artificial surface, it's going to perform differently. So, mm. Mm. And these, uh, this charter, Ian, um, does it cover everything you want to cover? Or is it... Uh... Yeah, look, I think it's pretty comprehensive. And then obviously uh, there's detail in relation to what falls underneath that charter. And, um, and we work closely with the associations from other sports to share information in relation to what best practice is with respect to the rights of the players that we're seeking to protect and further. OK. Viewers, we've got to go to a sponsor's break. Stay tuned after the break. We'll take up this discussion with Ian Prendergast and John Carences. Back to the show, we're discussing this very important issue about player welfare, especially in AFL and other codes. Ian, there's been a lot of injuries, especially in the NRL, life threatening injuries and also career ending. Alex McKinnon, you're familiar with that accident, yeah, aren't you? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And there's been a few others like that. Many, many years ago, Neil Saxe, Footscray, centre half back, got a uh, knee in the back, he became a quadriplegic. Now, 
As the uh, system currently stands, what would he get? What does Alex McKinnon get? Yeah, well, I'm not sure about Alex McKinnon because clearly he falls under the, the oh, NRL's rules. An AFL but footballer, what would he get? An AFL footballer, well, there's, there's total and permanent disability coverage for players, but it is quite limited and the criteria you have to satisfy is, is very onerous. So okay. I'm not sure, um, you know, somebody who suffered uh, an injury like that would actually qualify for the insurance that's available. Wow. What, how much is the maximum coverage? Um, TPD roughly. You put me on the spot now. 500,000? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's about right. that. Okay. And then there's some okay. additional cover we take okay. out. That's under the there's super and then there's some additional cover that we take out with the oh. AFL. John, what concerns me is you've got these um, athletic people that, you know, have got potentially 10 or 15 years of oh, yes. uh, sporting life. They could earn, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 million. Exactly. They get taken out very early in their career mm. and they don't really get much in return. Well, it seems like they're underinsured, Tony. Yeah. They need yeah. to make sure that they are insured for these life-threatening events. Ian, just on the issue of underinsurance, mm. I've got the feeling that the accident compact probably wouldn't cater for your players. The AFL's picked up some serious money in their broadcasting rights. Why can't they pay for the insurance? Yeah, well, at a uh, high level. Uh, as I said earlier, it, you know, the, the insurance coverage is collectively bargained. Yeah. So there's uh, money that goes towards injury compensation. Um, the query is, I guess, who should be funding that? Should that come out of the money we negotiate for all players, or mm. should it come out of a separate pool of money that okay. we um, that we look to put some, some insurance around? Because the difficulty is that the players can't actually access comprehensive insurance around um, you know, income protection, for example. They, they just, um, yeah, there's too no high viable risk. scheme out there. Too, too high, high risk. High risk. Yeah. Insurers won't, won't go near it. So, um, yeah, we've, we've been talking to the AFL for, for a number of years now about continuously uh, improving the coverage available to players as we prepare for the next um, collective bargaining um, negotiations. That'll be another priority for us. And the players are contracted to the AFL, aren't they? They are, so Did the AFL's point. a party yeah. to the, the contract yeah. with the clubs. Ian, have you been assisting the Victorian Work Cover Authority in its investigation with the Essendon saga? Um, we've had discussions with um, Work Cover as part of that investigation. It's my understanding that they're now going to go and talk to all of the, the Essendon players mm. in relation to what happened there, and there's a number of other clubs that they're looking into. But certainly what happened at Essendon um, you know, is is far more serious than any other issues that we're aware of at other clubs with respect to the supplements programs that they had in place. Your, your position would be the welfare of the players? Absolutely. Now, there's a big question mark about that, isn't there? Yeah, certainly in terms of what happened down at Essendon. Um, we've put things in place with the AFL since to ensure that a situation like that can never happen again. Mm. And it is critical because these players go into an environment um, at a young age uh, where there's a lot of controls in place in relation to you know, what they're told and who they're told to trust. So you know, whilst we need to really empower these players to understand that they're individuals and almost to develop a healthy disrespect for authority, um, they are under an employment contract where they need to follow the reasonable directions of their employers. So mm. you can understand you know, why they will accept certain things that are said to them. And in the Essendon situation, notwithstanding, they, they asked a lot of questions, sought a lot of information, um, clearly, things went off the rails from a governance point of view and these players were put at risk, which is completely unacceptable. John, if you recall Fistville, the firefighters couldn't get compensation mm. working in a very toxic environment. Oh, yes. I'd imagine the players, if they want to pursue some sort of rights as to affecting their welfare in the future... Oh, yes. It's too speculative. I can't see how they could possibly link any future health issues to whatever was injected into them, especially it's... in view of the findings that nothing went wrong. Well, the findings were that there were no there was Not no pa evidence. there was no paper trail, okay. Tony. Okay. The paperwork had been destroyed by who knows who, by some some person. There was no paperwork to show what, what was injected, was injected okay. into the players. Yeah, okay. well, the findings were that they haven't been administered a banned substance under mm. the anti doping code. Yep. Yep. Um, what we have put in place is a, a protocol to monitor players' health ongoing. So that um, is designed to identify whether there are, are any risks that yeah. um, we become aware of that may be linked to the substances that are administered throughout the program. 
which may also provide you with the ability to, to link that back yep, from yep. a causation point of view. Well, why don't we, John, you know what I think, uh, let's let the Work mm. Cover Authority and the AFL Players Association mm. do their investigations. Oh, they and, are, yes. Yeah, and we'll probably get Ian back to have that mm. as a whole episode. You, well, you want to come back for that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all hoping that uh, we can move on with our lives and nothing um, happens to these, these young blokes who have been yep, through yep. so much. But exactly. I'm more than happy to discuss any developments yeah. as and when they occur. <laughs> Ian, can I raise this issue? In the US, the courts ordered the National Football League to put into a trust a billion dollars to cover the cost of about 5,000 former players that have suffered concussion and any ongoing effects from that. Is that what you're currently trying to do in the Victorian Footy League? Yeah, certainly concussion's uh, an issue we're taking extremely serious. A very um, big issue. Our players suffer a number of concussions uh, on average you know, throughout their career. Mm. So uh, in terms of the, the emerging research that's coming out of the States, the settlement that you referred to there, it's something that we've been looking at very closely. Um, we've been certainly uh, advocating uh, in relation to changes that are necessary to, to mitigate the potential damage that concussion can cause our athletes mm. and the changes we've introduced with the AFL have been focused on increased education, um, changes to the rules, uh, the match day protocols that are used to actually assess a player for concussion removing them from, part, uh, from play if there is any doubt, mm. the return to play protocols, and then that follow-up support and treatment that we provide our players. Tony, one real issue is NFL players over in America, uh, they've got helmets on. I, know, I, I find it astounding. AFL players don't, don't. And they get concussed, and the, the week later, they're still playing again. I just, I'm just wondering whether you get brain injuries and also memory loss and things like that, John. Of course you do, yeah, from concussion, yeah, from yeah. a head injury. It's akin to being in a car accident, Tony. Yeah. And anything else you'd like to add? We've come to the end of the show, mate. It's come, it's gone yeah, really quick. Yeah, it's an interesting topic for us. Um, clearly, you know, our role is to try and protect the, the health and well-being of, of players, including their, their safety, uh, and to ensure that if they do get injured, you know, they're fairly compensated. So it's an important role that Players Association across the country play, but there are athletes out there that don't have the same representation, but certainly deserve the same coverage. So um, I think it's, it's an issue that the government needs to take very mm. seriously from that point of view. Well, viewers, if you've got any other questions you might have, or if you're one of these young players, don't hesitate to ring up Ian Prendergast of the O5 Players Association. Thanks for coming thanks on board Tony. today, Ian. Cheers, thanks, John. John, thanks, uh, thanks Tony. As usual. Thanks, viewers. viewers. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for future episodes. Go to our social media websites, Twitter and Facebook, and always remember to stay safe. Thank you.